do believe there were some eyes that weren't quite dry. And we'll just pretend it's joyful anticipation for my sermon, but we know better. Um, thank you for that. So our message today, is, as I have alluded to throughout the service, is about joy. A return to joy is the title of this message. And uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide for me, if you will. This is from Psalms 119, verse 111. And uh, Psalm 119 I believe the longest psalm in the book of Psalms says, Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. We will be discussing today, friends, the joy of our hearts. So I remember what it was like to be a new Christian. Not a new member of a church, or the first time I watched the Passion of the Christ movie, although that was good too, but know actually what it felt like to trust Jesus. I was maybe 30 years old when I knelt down on the bottom stair of my split foyer home and I admitted to God that I needed him in my life. It felt honestly like kind of a road to Damascus conversion for me in many ways. And when we talk about the uh, road to Damascus, we are talking about Saul or Paul on his way to visit that city when the Lord Jesus came to him in a flash of light from that moment on, even after Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul, his understanding of God was changed forever. Yes? So I had heard the biblical stories before as a child, even before I was 30 years old, but now they were real to me. Now they had weight, meaning, and they applied to my life. And so I could see this truth of Scripture being reflected all around me, uh, and other people, in society, and myself, and it was, it was startling to me. Uh, I remember thinking so often, boy, have I been asleep for the first part of my life? What's going on here? I missed it. I was missing it. And friends, no one who meets the real Jesus stays the same as they were before. It doesn't happen. You are changed. And I was so, so joyful during that time. So if we look at a little bit deeper, uh, Paul's experience at Damascus, I'm going to read from Acts 9, and it says this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. We know the story continues from there on. Paul was blinded temporarily. I can only imagine what he was grappling with. So, so Saul starts out punishing people for what he feels is what God wants him to do. Jesus comes to him. Now, it wasn't that Paul didn't know God. He knew about God. He was highly trained, highly educated, but rather his experience was academic and judicial. Now, Jesus had engaged his heart as well as his mind. His role as ruthless enforcer would begin to change. Or for some of us, meeting with Jesus is a slower process that happens over time. It's not as dramatic. More like what's called the walk to Emmaus. We will read about here the walk to Emmaus from Luke chapter 24. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them. Notice, no flash of lightning this time. It's different. But they kept, they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? So in other words, here's these two men making a long journey, seven-mile walk, um, not the greatest terrain, probably. Jesus comes to them, stops them from recognizing him, asks them what they're talking about. They turn to God's Son and say, Where have you been in a cave? Okay? And from there, I can only imagine the conversation. He 
these three folks had. But you'll notice it's a slower progression. They have a chance to think and reason from Scripture. Jesus met with them for a time, and the Spirit had a chance to work on their hearts. They encountered the joy of Christ differently that day than Saul did. Similarly with me, I think, looking back, God gave me about two years to study and dedicate my time to Scripture, apologetics, Christian reading, kind of like my mini seminary sabbatical. And now important to know, I believe, either conversion experience is valid. Don't let a Damascus person tell you that your Emmaus conversion wasn't good enough or vice versa. And quite frankly, I believe we can have a little of both. My conversion changed a number of things for me. Uh, for example, I remember doing crazy things like withdrawing $20 bills from the ATM and shoving it into coat pockets of my coworkers. True story. When they turned off their computers to go home for the night, put their coats on, their hands slipped into their pocket, and they found money. I remember one lady even went from cubicle to cubicle in our little office building asking people, did you put money in my coat? Did you put money in my coat? True story, I was just, I was double over laughing. I was trying to be quiet in my office. This is top-notch entertainment, folks. You've got to be a little bit careful when you do that so it doesn't backfire. Not everybody knows how to handle that type of kindness, but you understand what I'm saying. That, that person would now have a free lunch because of what Jesus had done in my heart joy. In fact, if all of you check under your seats, there should be 20. <laughs> Church humor. Well, since then, friends, a number of years have gone by. Why had I done those types of things? Because I was happy to be alive, happy to be under God's grace, joyful to be forgiven and free. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Why don't I do these types of things anymore? After all, God is still faithful. I'm still his, right? Has God changed or have I changed? I was also really annoying to other people at that time in my life also. And I found that sometimes others don't know how to, how to deal with people who are happy for no reason. They don't get it. It's weird and off-putting. And it's like, why is it smiling all the time? You know? It stands out, right? I was, as the Bible says, a new Christian, full of zeal, but maybe without knowledge. And I think many of us forget what it's like to have this overjoyful freedom in Christ. We get caught up in the, in the throes of raising family, going to work, paying bills. And I remember uh, I was at the Davis County Carnival when it was in Bloomfield, and certainly this happened with the Drakesville reunion as well uh, here recently this weekend. And I would watch little kids ride the rides. Okay. By the way, some of the rides you'll never get me on. Okay? <laughs> Things that go around and around and, and spin around and stuff like that. Forget it. Uh, I'll tell you everything you want to know. I'm not getting on that. But they would ride these rides, and I'd look in their faces, and there was pure, unadulterated, unabashed joy. Okay? Except for the kids that ate foot-long corn dogs and they went on the rides. Uh, <clears throat> my youngest son, Owen, he's not sitting here, but that happened to him. <laughs> And I'm looking at the kids riding these rides, and they're all smiling like this, and Owen's literally going, <laughs> and he got off that ride, and we had to sit on a bench together. But it, it you know, you, you watch the kids' faces, and, and you see joy. No strings attached, nothing else, pure joy. And even experienced Christians can lose track of the type of joy that God provides. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus tells the church in Ephesus that they had forsaken the love they had at the beginning. In fact, go to the next slide, please. If we read Revelation 2, verse 4 to 5, it says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Friends, Jesus loved this church like the other six churches. And that is why he was warning them, return to me, he was saying, love me again, put me first, that you might have my joy. 
And I think that many of, my, many of us, uh, myself included sometimes, we kind of do the same thing. We get caught up in our daily lives. We get real busy. We're on autopilot. Did you know, by the way, at home, I have three calendars? Some of you do as well, probably. That means in order to make an appointment, I need to check three different places. And I think it might be worse for my daughter and wife. They're even busier. So I have to wonder to myself, is this conducive to allowing the Holy Spirit to work freely in my life? Probably not always, at least without some determined prayer time and meditation. It is hard to capture joy when we don't have time to check in regularly with God. And I think we should meditate on God and His Spirit regularly. In fact, Psalm 119 verse 15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What are the desires of our heart, friends? It is godly joy. Now, I should pause here a moment to say there's a difference between joy and happiness. Some of you know this already. Happiness is dependent upon your circumstances. We have, you know, things going well for us. There's plenty of money in the bank. Our health is good. We can be happy. Not so easy to be happy when things aren't going your way, but we can still have joy, the type of joy that comes from a relationship with God. And some of you here today know exactly what I'm talking about because not everything is going great, but you are still here. You are showing up to church. You are smiling. You are shaking people's hands. You have not given up. Praise God. Joy that is not dependent on things going well, not dependent on whether or not people like you or that you're popular. God's contentedness is different. It's better. It is a gift. So I want to offer you some spiritual homework today for this coming week if you choose to accept it. I want you to do the following two things when you go home after church. Next slide, please. Two things. I want you to pray that God would show you someone in your life that needs your help. Someone in your circle, someone in your social circle at work, maybe, who you know. And secondly, when God shows this person to you, do something to help them. Not in a proud or boastful way that would hurt someone's feelings or advertise that you are doing a good deed for all to see. You know, don't walk someone across the street and take a selfie and put it uh, on the internet and say, look how good I'm being. Not that type of help. But in a way that doesn't make someone feel inadequate, self-conscious, or needy. And if it entails watching their child while they run to the grocery store for a gallon of milk, do it. If it means evangelism, sharing the gospel message with someone that needs it, give it a try. I believe that if we pray this prayer sincerely, these two things will happen. God will show us someone. After all, what would it look like to put on your jacket at the end of the day and find a $20 bill? Well, when you, uh, my wife and I used to attend a church years ago, and incidentally, funny enough, it was called Sunday Church. Uh, and there was a point in our lives where uh, you know, my mother was in and out of the hospital, and in fact, I think during this time she was actually in the hospital, and my wife was in and out of the hospital with preterm contractions, uh, and during this time, it was very stressful for us, okay? Uh, there may not have been happiness, okay? Uh, but, but people from the church would show up and they'd bring food, okay? So they'd knock on the door, and I'd open the door, and there'd be these fantastic smelling concoctions, okay? And the joy that that brought us, and the joy that it brought them, and I think it did because they always showed up with a smile. They were doing it for God. They were doing it for us. So next slide. I want to talk about John chapter 15, 9 through 11. And this is an anchor scripture. And what it says is, this is Jesus talking, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands.
hands and everybody in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Joy also has to do with obedience, you see. Jesus said, if you keep my commands. Things seem to go better that way when we follow scripture and we cultivate a healthy fear of the Lord, I think. And I remember a similar story years ago. Uh, my family and I received a small inheritance, at least I think it was an inheritance. This was years and years ago. Uh, not enough to retire on, but still it was a nice surprise. And I remember going back and forth in my mind thinking, well, I remember something in the Bible about tithing 10%, but ah, it's the Old Testament and I need a new pair of shoes and I don't know if I should do that. My kids are young and everything's expensive. Oh, uh, but wait a minute, got the Bible says tithe this and that and the other. And so eventually after struggling with it and talking about my wife, uh, to my wife about it, we decided to tithe 10% to the church. If I remember this right, the next week we started getting weird checks in the mail. Uh, surprise refund, refunds from health insurance companies, uh, a little bit here, a little bit there. And I should have sat down and added it all up because I bet it was the same cost as the tithe, the 10% tithe. I don't know. Point is, God surprises us again with his joy, his joy to help us. My joy in following his commands was made complete. So church, my question for you this morning, is your joy complete? Has it been made whole? Do you sometimes annoy people out of the overflow of happiness in the Lord? I pray that you do. Let's pray together. Father God, we pray to receive your joy, to recognize it and accept it when it shows up in our life, that we can remain content whatever our circumstances, Lord, because we know you're happy to pass it on to us. And we pray finally, God, that we pass that joy on and pay it forward when it comes our time to do so. We don't hold on to it. We don't be selfish about it. We pass it on. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.